very good. Yeah, I think so. Oh yes, Mark and I go way back. <laughs> the well, welcome everybody. Thank you for, for coming today. Um, we hope we have a nice few hours for you. I think it'll be interesting. Um, what, what we'll do is we'll, we'll take 15 or 20 minutes to kind of just uh, throw up some history of the company, kind of give you a, a little bit of background of, you know, who we are, what we do, where we're located. So as you go out on the floor, it'll give you a better perspective as to the hows and the whys uh, related to, to what you'll see out there. Uh, we have two locations, uh, our uh, Chicago plant, which is where we are now, of course. And then we also have a plant down in uh, a city called Saltillo, Mexico. Well, and we'll spend some time talking about that as, as well. This is where we are. Uh, background of, of our company. You know, essentially what I think you'll see out there is uh, you'll see a lot of spring making, wire form, manufacture, small stampings, which we call flat form stampings, a lot of which are four slide machines. You'll see progressive stampings. Uh, you'll see uh, lap water rings. And um, that's essentially our product line. It's fairly broad. It's fairly deep. Lots and lots of machines, lots and lots of different types of machines. So we go from very, very small to a relatively large uh, in size within our industry. We tend to be focused very heavily on higher volume, fairly stringent uh, industries. The automotive industry, first and foremost, is, um, and then uh, the home appliance industry. And between those industries, those are uh, those account for probably about 80% of our sales. So we're very, very heavy in those particular markets. But then, in addition to that, uh, we work with some, some market leaders and other other select industries, which uh, which we have listed up there as well. We are a privately uh, held company. Uh, have always been and tend to be somewhat financially conservative over the years. Uh, the recession, of course, like with all companies, put some strains on us, but I think the fact that we were relatively conservative is going to help us weather that storm. Our uh, Chicago operation was, was founded in uh, 1946 by a Polish immigrant by the name of Joseph Dudek. So it's, it's a great story. Part of the story is that uh, he arrived here in, I believe, what, 1929? It's Michael's grandfather. 1936, I believe, or six. So, so when he got here, it was a recession. So he, he kind of got here, and it was the land of opportunity. It really wasn't the land of opportunity. And then I'm staying and, 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 and ended up uh, starting this company. Where, where we are now is about 225,000 square feet. Uh, it is a TS16 949 certified facility. We also have ICER 14,001 certification. Um, a lot of what you see out there is, is um, we feel like we do a lot of things well, but in four slide machinery, design, uh, tooling, we feel like that is a core competency of us. We, we, we tend to you know, support our customers, look at parts, try to provide our engineering uh, insights to help parts be designed for manufacturability. We don't actually own the intellectual property, our customers own it, it's a customer footprint, but oftentimes we will help design it so that it can be made ideally on one shot, you know, the, you know through, through the years. We try to have more and more of our parts just come directly off a machine. Well, you know, our view is if, you're, if the more fingerprints there are on a part, that's a bad thing. So if we can design it to, so that it's designed to run on a machine and drop off without anybody having to do anything else, that's uh, that's the ultimate goal for us. So that's one of the things we feel like is, is an area of expertise uh, for us. If at any point uh, there's anything you want to talk about, you know, we've got a, a number of our people here who hopefully uh, can address any questions you might have. Four, four slide is the the one shot process. Four slide is a uh, is, is a is a machine. You'll see it out there that uh, it's a it's a tool based process that uses cams to to, to form parts either you know from, from wire or from flat stock into the different configurations. We uh, machine wise, but we're, uh, I'm not even sure we know how many machines we have. We you know, somewhere we. Somehow the number 500 came up. But you, you see you know, a lot of machines on the floor. There's machines in storage. There's machines in Mexico. Um, there's just kind of machines everywhere. And I, and I think in some respects it's become a, a core competency of us as well. When you get so many machines, you have to maintain so many machines, you just get really, really good at it. And, and that's kind of become a, a core competency of us, that we can take machines, whether they're older machines, um, newer machines, and, and really kind of uh, design parts to come off of these and, and essentially kind of to kind of scale uh, the type of machine, the age of the machine, the capital cost of the machine to the application. So you can sort of tailor where we are from a price point standpoint to, to fit the, uh, the customer's applications. 
um, in, the, in the mid 2000s, 2005 to 2007, 8, before the recession, we were spending a lot of money on CNC equipment, both uh, for here as well as for Mexico. And um, so, we, in addition to using tool based parts, we, we, we do have a fair amount of CNC uh, capabilities as well. We do, uh, you know, in house tool making, 95% in house maintenance, as I mentioned. And then we have a series of other capabilities that, that support whatever the part requirements are that are listed along, along the bottom of this as well. <clears throat> one other thing, when I went through the original tour here, one of the things that I was really impressed with was the in-house design and the, the tool making and, and the, the dies that you that you work with out there are, are primarily in-house, they're engineered in here, and, and the processes are all engineered in-house. And I, I think that's, that's just a really, it, it, it's a lot of companies have gone away from that. They've outsourced it. What has what has been the competitive advantage for you to, to keep that uh, that process in house? Certainly, part of it is the experience of our engineers. Mm -hmm. You know, they've all been here quite a number of years. You know, they know the machines, they know the parts, they know the capabilities, and to form out engineering, you know. <clears throat> We may want to do it differently than, than somebody else would, because we know better. Mm -hmm. We've been around a lot of years, we know, we know how the, the, the wire reacts. So it's important for us to uh, engineer most of the parts here. Yeah, I think you take some of the risk out as well. Yeah. I mean, you take some of the risk that's easy to insert as well. And the tool maintenance itself. I mean, we build tools to sustain a certain amount of pieces, so I think that's important too. Absolutely. That's that's one thing that we'd like to you know, actually go into is that we're going to bring you back by our tool maintenance room, and that is an area that has you know you have a you had a seminar yesterday on maintenance as a profit center as I believe as yes. I recall, and uh, we strongly believe that we believe that if we do the maintenance in house, our costs are greatly reduced. Uh, the fact that we have a machine shop in the back where we can make our own repairs and keep our tools in tip-top order means that our part repeatability is tremendous. As we make parts, we do not have to send out our tools to be sharpened to an outside source, which means that if they need sharpening, we do it right then. So uh, we have a tremendous advantage in our, in a, not only in our tool and engineering department, and you'll see that we have a, a substantial number of engineers who work here full time, which is um, above the norm for a spring company. And we also have our maintenance department, which is quite extensive and works on a surprising array of machines. For example, right now we have an issue with our shot peener. Um, it's a four week fix situation, but we will be doing it in house. We will not be calling in a consultant for that. Um, regular routine maintenance on our machines can be done regularly and on and, and we can adhere to a schedule because we have the guys on site in house. So how do you maintain the, the skills of those people, teach new people, bring in new people? Are you, are, you know, that, that's a challenge to find good people in, in those skilled trades and the engineering good young side. Pardon? Good young people. Good young people, yeah. I know in, in engineering we have at least one new fellow that they're uh, at least on, on the CAN system right now, mm -hmm. and he was a, he came from the from the tour room, but he is eventually going to be one of the engineers also. Okay. Yeah, John Dunick, he's got a really strength. I mean, a really strong belief for cross training and training that he provides here. So, <coughs> and there's a the, the skilled workforce here. It's been it's been here for for many years. You know, we've really had a lot of turnover as far as employees. There's also a lot of osmosis as well, for lack of a better word, where, you know, we corporate-wide, we do something like, you know, 1,500 active parts, and that, that's, that's a lot of parts. And so, as people leave, people go on vacation, people fill in, it, you know, there, there's, there's that osmosis that just a, eventually kind of, you know, just gravitates, you know, uh, between people. And I think you see that in terms of the engineering parts, in terms of the, the tool making, the tool, the tool maintenance. Just you know, something you know, it just happened where it's kind of a, uh, just a continual you know flow of information. We get a critical mass of parts like that. We tell you about something. Yeah, one more thing. Um, with the place that we really have youth in.
in this business is in our Mexico plant. Our Mexico plant is very young, very vibrant. Most of the employees are in their 20s, um, some are in their 30s, but because of that center of youth, we've brought them up here to work with our guys. So they might stay here for six weeks and learn how to learn the ins and outs of running a machine, maintaining a machine, go through the process of setting up a part several times. So they get really acclimated. And then they go back home, and then when they're ready to come back up again for more knowledge, we bring them right up here. To, to us, it's a tremendous investment in our people. And that's why we have a low turnover in Mexico, because I think they feel that they get well-educated here and they're very well-equipped for doing their jobs. Hi, would you mind talking a little bit about quality? Since 1999, we started getting the QS first, and then after three years, we went into TS. Since you are making 80% of the products to appliance industry, what we did is we maintain ISO 9001 as well as TS 6949 certification. Then after six years, we went into the environmental also because some of our customers wanted us to be environmentally certified. So we are three certifications at the same time being maintained. <coughs> and every six months they come and audit us and we maintain ourselves pretty good and uh, improve continuously. And uh, we look into all the other certifications available too, like uh, TAS9100 also we are looking into it. And then PPM tracking. We, you know, our customers, of course, are vigilant about PPM tracking. We're vigilant about PPM tracking. It's, it's a metric that's continually Posted, and everybody is is, is pretty centrally focused on that. <clears throat> Some of the other things that we track, in addition to PPMs, both internal, external, cost of quality, on-time delivery, uh, customer returns, inventory uh, turns. We just have a, a tremendous amount of metrics in addition to these that we track, you know, very religiously to make sure we're we're always on track. You know, and one of the other things that we we did over the years is it, we is is the is the China threat came in and affected really all businesses is to put in an opportunity. We felt like that was an opportunity to put a stake in the ground and say, you know what, whatever we have here, it's, it's going to be world class. And because in the absence of that, we, we felt like we had to give our customers a reason to continue to buy from here. So some people come through this plant, we've had people come through and say, it's amazing you're still doing this much manufacturing in Chicago in, in this day and age, especially in this industry. And, and I think had it not been for the stake that we put in the ground going back into the early 2000s with this China threat where we said we want to be able to take customers through and, and give our customers uh, the arsenal to go back to the high level purchasing executives, engineering executives, supplier development people and say these guys are good, it's worth buying from this particular company in the United States, even though we have a plant in Mexico, that we can in good conscience feel like we're buying from a facility where we are not overpaying. And so we felt like we had to institute some, some metrics, and these are these are a little bit hard to see, that we could keep ourselves on track. And essentially, we you know we, we look at um, machine performance, we we look at uh, our labor ratios that are set in certain metrics. How many machines does a given individual have to run? In, uh, and these are different for each of our departments, depending on what whatever uh, analysis we came up with. We look for overall for kind of a cost per earned hour, which looks into overtime. Um, labor rates, machine utilization, and then, you know, overall we just, you know, look at, uh, we look at over, we track four of these metrics and bring them together, and we look at these every two weeks. And so this was one of these situations where people, I think, initially thought, you may remember where it's like, okay, this is a study, and you know, studies come, studies go. Um, this will go away. And it's been, I think, eight years. It's still not going away. It's, it's been institutionalized as part of our culture. And this is one of the things that we, we feel very proud of. It we, we know what our costs are, and we, we know how effective we are. And within our cost structure, if, if we can compete, then you know we're okay with that. But we know we're doing everything we can to be a uh, world class in terms of our efficiencies and effectiveness on the floor. When you say automatic metrics, you, you have a system that uh, feeds those auto automatically based on output. That, that's actually a particular department we have. It's called a, an automatic. Department. So we have a four slide department, punch press department, four slide department. So that's actually one of our specific departments. Okay. And this is just one of.
many, many that uh, we can grab and throw up here just as an example. Thank you. Did the strategy drive the metrics or did the metrics drive the strategy? Did, did you decide we're going to be we're going to be world class and here are, uh, and now we're going to create a set of metrics to do that, or did you look at the metrics and say we can be world class uh, by continuing to follow these lines? I think it was more the the, the former case where we said what's what's the best we can be. You know, it was just, it was the clipboard, the stopwatch. I mean, you know, Ken, you probably remember this as well. It was clip, you know, clipboard, the stopwatch, going through everything. It was we were benchmarked ourselves against. Mm -hmm. Uh, other manufacturers that had what we felt were similar manufacturing operations. We said this, this, these were best in class, and we were not. We were not best in class. Going back to 2000, we were. We weren't. We weren't, and it, and it was a long process, and it was kind of painful. It was you know, a little bit of culture shock for people, but it, it was very sobering when our prices for these very high volume parts were, were benchmarked globally, and we benchmarked them against ourselves, even even in Mexico. And, and right now, we are probably. Ken, what would you say our efficiency level here is compared to, to Mexico? It's a hard question, but in terms, efficiency in terms of our labor efficiency, through, through throughput per man hour, I mean, we're definitely more efficient here. We're more efficient here. Yeah. Maybe twenty-five percent. Yeah. So we're so so there's an advantage. <laughs> there's definitely an advantage, and and that part of that's experience. You know, eventually, do we, we want our Mexico plant to get where we are? Yeah. We don't think they're inefficient, but we think we're very efficient. So probably a slightly higher labor cost here, but yes. you're more efficient with the, the yes. more experienced labor. And in a lot of cases, yeah. the parts are going to be used here, and the particular raw material is not available down there. Now you're paying the to get the material down there. Mm -hmm. You're paying to get the, the, the parts back up, and by the time you do that, when you look at the, the small difference in efficiencies, in a lot of cases, doesn't make sense to make it down there. If the parts are staying down there, then it's a good idea. Right. If the parts have secondary operations, <coughs> it, it's a little smarter to make it down there. But if it's just something coming off the machine, you know, here in some cases, you guys are watching three, four machines, it doesn't pay to make it down there, especially if the parts are being used up here. And that equation just got a little more expensive as oil prices went up 75 cents a gallon. Absolutely. And, and, and uh, Karen actually deals with a number of our, our major accounts. And, and you, you, you have a great, you can speak to this, a great number of parts that actually were made here that shipped to the Midwest. How often do you get, call it, a lot of pressure to take these parts and ship it to the Midwest down, down to Mexico? Not that much anymore because of the cost of freight. It just it keeps going up and up and up. And to cost it down there, most of them, people in the Midwest, have milk run trucks too. So they've got a truck coming through Chicago, which is a great point. It's coming. Through Chicago, it stops and pick up parts. They don't have a lot of milk truck trucks coming up from Mexico back to the Midwest, so it's cost effective for them. So they may pay a few pennies more for it here, but they're saving in the long run because of the freight up from Mexico. I mean, there are still cases where you know we ship out of Mexico back to the Midwest, but I don't think it's it's not what we thought it would be. Right. It wasn't. They make everything in Mexico. Speaking of Mexico, here's here's a picture of our, a plant down there. Which, uh, you know, we started in 2000 with uh, about 30,000 square feet. A few years later, doubled it to 60,000 square feet. And a few years after that, moved it up to 85,000 square feet. And, and now we're considering even uh, partially expanding it even, even more. It was one of these situations where when everybody was going to China, we kept doubling Mexico, expanding Mexico. We felt like that was, that was the place for us. We have uh, anywhere between 180 and 200 employees. Uh, depending on the, the sales volume at any one time. The plant's run by our Vice President of Engineering, who's been running the plant for over four years now. Um, you know, we thought, you know, to have a guy that's got an engineering background, and he understands quality, he understands manufacturing, he understands customer viewpoint, uh, it's, you know, we concluded it was important to have kind of, you know, somebody that kind of come up out of this system, culturally, that down there running, running the plant. It, it is TS-16949 certified, as well as ISO 14001. And essentially what we're doing down there is over the years, over the last 10, going on 11 years now, we've been just transferring equipment down there and kind of mirroring what we have. So one of our customer needs, we prepare the equipment here, uh, we set everything up and we, uh, we move the equipment down onto the floor there and away we go. And that's, that's how the business has evolved over the years.
here's a picture of our the plant there a few years ago. This is probably going back four or five years ago. This is just one part of the plant. This is the same shot of the plant uh, more recently. So you can see how the plant has just become more, a little dirtier, uh, more densely packed. <clears throat> Given the clean slate the opportunity that you had there, did you find um, opportunities for efficiency and workflow uh, as you set up down there? I missed the last part. Find opportunities for efficiency and workflow. And workflow. Right. Yeah. You know, I work could, work cells or yeah. material flow through the plant. It's um, it's set up pretty much as you would, you would expect. I don't know that we've sort of uh, had any you know silver bullet moments, kind of aha moments down there, but it, it does flow well. I mean, there's there's an area, you know, you know, to the right where where, where inventory is, and um, you know, I, I do think it's it's kind of set up purposely, you know, by department, pretty much the same way it, it is here. So I don't think that we there was anything unique. It, it's well set up, but I don't think it's better set up than than what we have here. We do, we do have work cells, particularly for parts that have secondaries. You know, if we're making an, an auger for an ice maker that has a it comes off the the machine to begin with formed. Now we have to flatten the end and we have to thread it. You know, that's done in a work cell. Sure. You know, so the parts aren't traveling all around the plant to get the, the operations done. Thank and you. Parts that are heated, you know, they'll be put in oven by the machine. So, mm -hmm. Ken said, create a unique work cell. So. Are a lot of those setups mandated by the customer that drove your plant down there? A little bit. I mean, a little bit. I mean, there's automotive sections, there's four slide sections. I mean, so it's it's internally well thought out. Mm -hmm. We started off small. You know, we were pretty much told by a, by yeah, a, that was a, one big a division line. of yeah. a, our appliance guy here saying, if you want to sell us down there, uh, you will be down. I remember that letter. And that was one of the big pushes yeah. I was in Jack's office that, that got us down there. And if it, wouldn't, if it wouldn't have been for them, I'm not sure if we would have moved that quickly down. I'm not sure if you have different thoughts about that, but I remember back then that they said if, if you're going to sell us down there, you're yeah. going to make the parts down there. Yeah. It, it, was a, it was a very good, in hindsight it was a blessing because when one of your major customers comes and they give you that that uh, encouragement, you know, <laughs> well, flip it over, it was also made and all that. <laughs> Just an encouragement. Yeah. 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 Sure. Sure. We started to research the market, take trips yeah. down there, and we started to analyze the other you know, our customer database, and we found that, you know, um, you know, people, you know, customers that comprised half of our business had, had operations down there, and increasingly you could see the writing on the wall that the product was going to ship there, and somebody was going to capitalize on the yeah. opportunity. And it, it just made good business sense. And frankly, if you go back all the way to the early 90s, where, you know, Ross Perot's giant sucking sound, you know, clarion call, we felt like maybe we had missed it in 2000 or the late, late 90s. And in reality, there, there are companies that still aren't there. And as we, as we looked at our experience, this has been... I mean, it's been, it's been, it's been, it's been a hard thing to do. I mean, uh, we we we, we calculated at one point how many uh, round trip flights we had cal uh, had purchased, probably during the first uh, five years, and it was something like you know 400 round trip tickets. And for a company our size, we're not a small small company, but that's a lot of time, energy, and resources. The money is one thing, but when you're putting people, when they're doing that. When they're doing that, they're not doing other things. And so it's a matter of where you put your chip, what square do you put them on? Because we, you know, we all have scarce resources. And, and so the, the, the investment down there, not just in terms of money, but in terms of opportunity cost, was, was massive. We're very, very glad we're down there. We've had people say to us at times, um, wow, you're, you're in the right place at the right time. You know, good for you. And, and, and our response to that is, you don't know the scars that we have. If you can see you know, the burns and the scars that we've gone through to, to, to get in the right place at the right time. You, know, you might not look at it that way. So it's been a tremendous investment, and um, it's it happened. It's a very, very good, very capable plant. We're doing somewhere on the uh, on the order of 250 to 300 parts of the automotive industry down there, and, um, and we feel like that's a good accomplishment because that's, that's kind of a zero tolerance industry. Product wise, these are the kind of things that you'll you'll see on the floor uh, out there. Uh, we, again, we go from very, very small to, to very large. And, and just to kind of give you maybe sort of some background, some rhyme and reason as to why you see so many different types of machines and so many varieties, what, you know, our, our historical focus has been to try to, we focus on a customer or a market segment 
and, and then we try to grow it. We, we get a good customer, uh, uh, a Fortune 500 customer, and then we try to grow with them and see what else we can sell you know, into their existing plants, their parallel plants, uh, throughout their product lines. Uh, we've done it in the appliance industry, pretty much any, any major home appliance. You're at, uh, you see we've got a product that, that's in there where we you know, start with springs, wire form, stamping work. We're now in the process in the last five years of doing it with, with the automotive seating market where we, we, we landed a given customer, a, a major player, and this is actually a real model. We sort of stripped out the customers, we landed a major customer, started to sell wire forms into them, and then have gradually tried to, to leverage um, you know, that, that market point into uh, other customers in the industry, and then while expanding our product line into counterbalance springs, we're looking at uh, uh, seat cushions, we're looking at possibly welding now, uh, we have conventional springs, so this is kind of how we're, our approach to the market. But when you do this, you end up buying equipment, buying machinery. And so our, our history in doing this has caused us to have just a wide variety of uh, machinery out on the floor. And that's, that's partly why you see so many different types of, types of equipment out there. Uh, you know, in the automotive seating segment, which has become an important part, you know, we've got you know, headrest applications here. We don't do the tubing. You can see some of the, you know, the seat frames here where we make the wire forms for these that our customers then drop into welding fixtures and, and weld them. We're also selling you know, counterbalance springs into those customers. We're selling conventional springs for, for, you know, for, for seat mechanisms. So that's part of our, that's part of our, our strategy to, to, to take customers, you know, strategy critical customers and do a really, really good job for them and not give them a reason to have to, to go anywhere. And of course, we have the ability to make parts in, in Chicago as well as Mexico. And so that's kind of you know, what we're doing right now. These particular parts are only made in Chicago and, you know, actually Ken's working on something now to get these set up to, to do in our Mexico plant. So there's this constant evolution and churn and, you know, building step by step by step that we, we go through. So anyways, you see the, the, all the machines, that's partly why. Here's just some pictures of what, what you'll see out there. A lot of go to seating wire forms. Now here's a... Uh, if you look closely on the right there, here's a cushion pan spring that goes in the Ford F family product. I think we make around 8 million of these a year. Yeah. Counterbalance springs we looked at. More wire forms. Small stampings on four slide machines. Conventional springs, progressive stampings. Welded rings. And then, and then lastly, uh, just, uh, steel prices up obviously have been very volatile since 2004. That's prompted our customers to, to try to work, have us work with them to, to try to take mass out of parts. And so this is this is you know a particular case for a, a fuel line clip that was historically a stamping that we helped engineer into a a wire form. And you can see that just the, the mass difference, kind of before on the top and after on the bottom. And so on the front side, we try to do this as well, but for existing applications, we have to work on these as, as well. So that's, that's some background there, just to, to get, just to give you a feel for what you'll, what you'll see on the floor. What's your current range of, of part production? How many parts are you producing? How many different parts? Uh, Corporate-wise, uh, we look at it as somewhere around 1,500 active parts between the, between here and New Mexico. Do you uh, do you do produce and ship, or do you have to do produce and hold? How, how does that work? No, we we try not to hold too long. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see some inventory out there. Yeah, okay, yeah. so we try to have minimum inventory. We, we, we try. We try closely. I, I, you know, you know, <clears throat> To answer your question, we are not just in time. Because based on the customer requirements, we do keep a safety stock based upon their requests and requirements. And sometimes it's better for us to have an economic setup and run certain quantity and put it in stock and waste that space. It will be beneficial for us in the long run, for us and for the customer. With 1,500 different parts and 500 pieces of equipment, you know that somebody, that four companies are going to come in the same time and want the same piece of equipment. 
<laughs> no, I think it happens to all of us. Yeah. What do you tell him, Ken? <laughs> <laughs> Talk to him. <laughs> do you I do think lots of times because of our product, by product base and because the fluctuation in the automotive market, it changes daily sometimes demand what they need. So we do have to have that buffer so that we can meet the needs of the customer so that they, you know, for example, I got a notification last week someone was increasing their production. They needed, you know, 1,200 extra pieces the same day to keep a production line going. So because I, you have that little bit of a buffer, you can meet their needs and their demands and then you're, you're a preferred supplier to them because you're Johnny on the spot helping them out of those situations. And then do you stamp or ID your parts in any way so that if there's any problem down the line? So, some stampings do. It's, it's a matter of course, typically not. Every once in a while you'll, you'll see some paint on for, for identification of color, but generally, generally it's rare that we mark our parts. It's basically, if it is, it's lock, customer requested. Yeah. Well, we have lock, you in, know. Lock, lock controls. We can trace back to particular runs and, and you know, all the way back to the steel supplier for the, for the heats of steel. Right. Any risk of obsolescence with the inventory that you can hold? Or? And that happens. I'm not sure what the dollar figure is per year. But very, very small amount of very small. Very small. Yeah. It's a typically for five year programs, maybe longer, so we can typically see the end coming. Yeah. There's a design change in midstream and you yeah. know typically we're pretty close. Yeah, I mean like usually the notification of build up, you get the notification of the customer build up letter and it's usually six months in advance and at that point you really start watching your your raw material and what you're producing and you know, because like I said, you usually got a five-year program. You know, okay, this is this is year one. We're okay so far. Right. Things are going okay. I mean, if we run an extra month, we're not going to be, you know, in that much jeopardy. At this point in the time, we just did, we've got a lot of build-outs going now for model year changes, so you're watching. And, you know, and, and there's a commitment, some commitment from the customer. You know, they, they tell you to be, you know, you have to be Johnny on the spot, and you have to watch your raw material, make sure you don't order it. You argue minimum buys, and it's like, well, you have to be the negotiator on the minimum buys then. Because you know, we're not going to pay you any more, we're not going to pay you, you know. Of course, they're never going to pay you any less. But <laughs> they'll always pay you less, but never any more. So it's just really watching the, the schedules that come out and the releases and then working with everyone internally to make sure there's no overruns. But sometimes, and we will overrun maybe a couple thousand pieces because there's always, we have a 15-year life for service parts. So to set up and run a machine for a 500-piece order is not worthwhile. So if you've got that overrun, you've got your stock, your service part order is covered, you know, and you can, you know, work from there so you're not wasting machine time in the future. And set up labor. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so yeah there's, there's some of these yeah. machines can go from anywhere from a 3-hour setup to a 20-hour 20, 20 setup. And you don't want to be setting those things up every two weeks if we can, if we can help it. That's why the inventory helps us in the extra. But you've also got to align your production scheduling with your maintenance scheduling so that in between those setups, you've got some time to work on the equipment. Right. I was trying to recall if I saw TPM listed up earlier. Uh, did I see that? Or maybe I'm getting TPM. Total production management. Uh, uh, again, quick changeovers, working on your changeovers. Is that something y'all put some? I put time and effort trying to reduce the amount of time it takes to do changeovers. Yeah, we monitor our setup hours, our maintenance hours. We have a lot of measurables. Yeah, yeah so we, we do um, setup hours, work centers, how many machines we're averaging per hour. So yeah, we, we do try to increase that. Not increase it, but maintain it and improve it. So yeah, a lot of measurables in that aspect. We did a project years ago where it was a similar part used across the board for multiple customers. The actual person came in and told us, said, we're going to recommend your company make these parts for the industry. And as we started growing with them, we tried to run all the similar parts in the same machine. So setup time between them, they were similar enough, so you cut down on your setup time. But then it came to the part of capacity. The machine can only run so many, so you've got to expand over as we grew. We had to grow into additional machines, but we spent a lot of time with an industrial engineer looking to see how we could quickly set up in between parts and what parts you could kind of work on the tooling that could be similar to keep it going forward for you. So it was a year, I think a year long process. It was a long process. It was yeah. long. It was pretty expensive. But it worked out very well for us because it was easy for quick chains over. Somebody drops them in, you could switch, quickly flip out to drop an order in for them and help out in that respect. 
to, to your question, I mean, you know, Michael has actually spent a fair amount of time looking specifically at, at, at jobs. This is what our standard is quoted for, for the setup, you know, the run rates, what was the actual, you know, comparing the actual versus the run rates, just to make sure we're on track, trying to improve those things. Ours, ours is a kind of business that if, if, if you didn't pay attention to detail, it would be really easy to not know what's going on. But, you know, culturally, we we just, it, it's been institutionalized, and we, we, we have to know what's going on. If it's, there's just so many parts that are coming through, coming through this facility. How do you manage your capacity or talk about your capacity for parts and, and suppliers and commitments to those and, and ups and downs? There's a vantage program. I mean, I would do the Wait, our, our computer advantage. system, you know, puts it in, we put our schedules into a computer program and then it goes into scheduling. We actually have an industrial engineer who spends time analyzing what parts go on machines, how many hours are quoted based on the capacity that the item was quoted at to see how the work centers can handle those. And it's just a constant, it's, it's a constant balance, you know, working with the department managers, you know, this part isn't it this week, okay, what do we got in safety stock, what do we have here, okay, we can flip out here sure. and, and manage through the program. So a lot of hands-on work sometimes for certain parts because if they have a secondary operation where they leave our building, we also have to control plating issues, heating issues, um, a lot of automotive, unfortunately, we, we actually have to send parts up to Michigan because those services aren't available in the area here. So working with the lead time, you know, of traffic up to Michigan, back to Michigan, and working with them hands-on to make it more economical to, I'm not going to ship you 200 pieces today and 300 pieces tomorrow. i got to ship you, a, you know, a couple skids because economically it's better for me to do that. Yeah, I think we, I think we utilize and take advantage of our computer software programs that, that we have. We also have an extensive APP process, advanced production planning, so that as we're planning for business, we hold a meeting every two weeks, and it's a high-level meeting. The president sits in, the vice presidents, and the managers. And we go through um, several sections. We go through what kind of um, plant maintenance we need to do on specific machines. So we'll say, okay, we need to install sensors on these machines. The progress is that this is 50% done, this is 53% done on each machine. So um, as we are doing repairs and maintenance, we keep track by percentage and by date. We have a target date for everything. You'll see the APP uh, meeting minutes up there. And uh, those are updated regularly. The green highlights would be things that are new, things that were added so that people can spot them easily. People's names are in bold and italics, so they can't miss their responsibilities. Um, and what we do is the top section is probably the most critical. The top section is projects, machine projects. So we would look at things that we are that are that need to be done. You can see some of them have priority number one, priority number two in the margin. Sometimes we have to put things on hold because we're waiting for parts or because of um, something else took precedence but mostly that first section is immediate attention projects. Then we go to machine issues. Machine issues would be things that we would like to do but have not yet kicked off. So we see an issue, we know it's coming up, we've got to address it. Then the next section would be capacity issues. For example, our 324 machines, uh, you'll see them out on the four slide floor, they are in high demand right now. We're just seeing all kinds of parts within the automotive industry especially that can be quoted on these machines extremely efficiently. They, they are workhorses with extreme repeatability in part making and um, they, they work very well for us. We make parts very economically on them. So we've got to have as many as we possibly can available for work. So we're always looking for new ones and it might also be an issue of if we need a machine that has a double top action then we would put on the capacity list that we're looking for to add double top action to X number of machines. And our goal is to do that by December of 2012. Um, and we are, you know, 60% on the way. Um, capacity issue also looks at our high tech machines to see where we are with our high tech machines in terms of capacity. When we buy a high tech machine, we typically are buying it understanding that it is 70% or more filled at the time we purchase it. So that we have to keep a very close eye on because if we need to expand capacity, 
we might have to take a part off of there, tool it on four slide, and go forward that way if the, if the part is, works for that. Or sometimes the uh, volume increases on a part, and so it makes sense to pull it off of that high-tech machine and put it on a workhorse mechanical machine. The next section, uh, let's see. And that, helps our, that helps our estimating department also. If they get a, a, a big project in that needs some of that CNC equipment or 324 and the capacity isn't there, then management has to decide what do we do. There is a weekly project management, right, that you guys send out. But over, over, over and above that, that's the projects we have. This is the projects that we hope to get and do we have capacity to, to fill up. Yeah. So right. we're constantly looking at the, the project's coming up to determine if, in fact, we may need more capital equipment. Um, so there's a lot of, Those are nice lot of gyrations. They're good problems to have. <clears throat> They're good problems to have, but if you have a, a good customer that, that comes through with a huge project and you have no capacity, then it makes it a little tougher. It makes it maybe a little easier to buy that equipment than if it was just somebody that was new with, with the potential not quite as, 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 as large as your current customer. The next section we have um, covers tool, ref, tool and machine refurbishment, but primarily it's for tooling. That if a customer's tool is wearing out or if their capacity is exceeding what we previously quoted, we would want to address that and make sure that we've started retooling a part. Physical plant, it has to do with 14,001. We're consistently looking at ways that we can improve our energy usage uh, primarily. So, for example, we put lighting in the warehouse that is motion detected lighting. We've got a program for um, making sure the lights are turned off in sections of the building that are not used. And we've got everyone very vigilant of shutting off lights behind them uh, as they go through an area that's not being used. IT issues uh, very often have to do with EDI and ASNs. Uh, barcode labeling, things like that. Stretch opportunities. We're always looking for what we can do that's new. When you go out into the plant, you'll see that we gained some um, new, ca uh, new capabilities in terms of counterbalance springs recently, where we purchased the assets of one of our competitors, and we're able to bring that in-house very successfully, and now we are a major supplier of counterbalance springs, which was not previously in our product line. That will be an example of something that will be in our stretch opportunities. Right now you see sinuous springs. That's a kind of a spring that goes into a car seat that is it's very curvaceous and can sometimes be on a radius. We don't currently make those, but we hope to soon. Capacity in the tool room, addressing you know where we are with, uh, with how full our tool, tool room is so we know when we can accept tooling jobs. And then the, the next one is primarily part issues. So if we want to take on some new business, we want to make sure that we have the hours available on the machines that we're quoting. So it would have things in there. Um, it, it wouldn't be an, a small quote where there's no real impact, that it wouldn't have a problem fitting in. But if new equipment is at stake, or especially high-tech equipment that's very expensive, we would want the visibility on this list so we know what's coming up. Okay. So I think it's the idea of trying to look at the primary angle. How we want to touch? There, you took me. Okay, so we're, I think we're, I think we're good here. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, thank you. Do we leave our things here, or? Uh, okay. Here, you want them?